So let me welcome you to the University of Edinburgh. We're one of the top 20 universities in the world, according to the QS World Rankings. And this year, we're celebrating 250 years of English literature at the university. And we can reflect on two and a half centuries of success, distinction, and innovation, confirmed not only by recent government research ratings, but very importantly by the fact that our students, the Edinburgh University Students Association, um, declared English literature the best department in teaching for 2012. Now, our English literature department can lay claim to have been the oldest of its kind in the world. More than 250 years ago, the university had the foresight to begin offering courses in what was then known as rhetoric and belles lettres. In 1762, George III appointed the Reverend Hugh Blair as the first Regis Chair in the subject. And Hugh Blair was our first Regis Professor of Rhetoric and Belles Lettres. Under the guidance of Blair, students were encouraged to move away from Latin and Greek texts and study more modern languages. He introduced his pupils to a much broader range of writing, ultimately developing the academic discipline of literary criticism as we know it today. And 16 Regis professors have followed down to the present day with Professor Greg Walker as the current Regis professor. The department is still at the forefront of understanding literature and what makes letters bell. It remains a vigorous center of scholarship, of teaching, and of learning. It's also the home of the renowned James Tate Black Memorial Prizes, Britain's oldest literary awards. They're judged annually by the staff and the students. And this year, I'm told, there's going to be the, the blackest of the black, the best of the James Tate Black um, uh, prizes is going to be decided uh, by the students and the staff. Our distinguished literary alumni include Sir Walter Scott, Robert Louis Stevenson, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, J.M. Barry, and more recently and probably more widely read by the general populace, Ian Rankin and Philip Gre Philippa Gregory. The department also supports creative writing by hosting distinguished writers in residence and currently the celebrated novelist Alan Warner. Our speaker tonight, Stefan Collini, our Enlightenment lecturer, is an English literary critic and a Cambridge academic. He's been a frequent contributor to publications such as The Guardian, The London Review of Books, The Times Literary Supplement, The Nation, as well as an occasional broadcaster. His books include Common Reading, Critics, Historian, Publics in 2008, Absent Minds, Intellectuals in Britain in 2006, English Pasts, Essays in History and Culture in 1999, and Public Moralists before that. Reviewers of his most recent book, which asks the very interesting question, what are universities for, described it as a must read and a fine addition to the debate about the purpose of university education, something that exercises us all. I'd like now to invite Professor Collini to give the Enlightenment Lecture from Belle Lettre to Inglit, is in his title, Criticism and Its Publics. Professor Collini. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. It is very mysterious about student surveys. I could have sworn ours told us that they thought we were the best department in English. <laughs> the immediate future belongs chiefly to the professors of English literature. The rise of modern universities has accredited an ambassador of poetry to every important capital of industrialism in the country. The professor of literature in a university should be a missionary in a more real and active sense than any of his colleagues. 
He has obligations not merely to the students who come to him to read for a degree, but still more towards the teeming population outside the university walls. The fulfillment of these obligations means propaganda work, organization, and the building up of a staff of assistant missionaries. But first, and above all, it means a right attitude of mind, a conviction that literature and life are in fact inseparable, that literature is not just a subject for academic study, but one of the chief temples of the human spirit in which all should worship. If you'll forgive me for saying so, your unease is palpable at this point, <laughs> uh, and especially perhaps among those of you who are my fellow professors of English, my fellow missionaries. Having this uniquely proprietary relation to the future would be burden enough, you might think, without having to incur the resentment of those professors of other subjects judged to be less essential to the work of converting the heathen. And as always, the heathen is great in number. There are not just the students, but the teeming population outside the walls. As I'm sure you've noticed, teeming is always something other people do. One doesn't team oneself. <laughs> now that opening quotation, as some of you may have guessed, comes from the report of the committee appointed by the coalition government. The, the Lloyd George coalition government, <laughs> uh, that is. Um, after the end of the First World War, to inquire, as its brief had it, into the position of English in the educational system of this country. Perhaps its metaphors alone may now seem to date it. The building up of a staff of assistant missionaries must, we feel, be an earlier and more colourful version of what we recognise as policies of recruitment and retention as part of a staff development strategy. Uh, but I'm afraid even I, and I've had some practice, I cannot quite render the idea of literature as one of the chief temples of the human spirit in which all should worship into current high ed speak, though I very much fear that any such rendering would include the terms aspirational and inclusive. But of particular interest for my purpose is the confident, casual, perhaps confident because casual, aside that literature is, of course, a subject for academic study. And it's the relation between that conviction and the obli obligation to connect it to that teeming population outside the walls that provides my theme this evening. The report, published in 1921, is commonly known as the Newbolt Report, after the committee's chairman, the jingoistic poet, Sir Henry Newbolt, and large claims have been made for its influence on the subsequent development of the subject. I have to say, a little scepticism is in order about these claims, and rather little of what professors of English actually did in the decades immediately following the report seem to have corresponded to its recommendations or to have shared its somewhat overwrought enthusiasm. But the inquiry was, without question, a resounding endorsement of the place of English in the educational system at both school and university level. And it provides a convenient staging post in the journey summarised by the terms of my title this evening, From Bell Let to Eng Lit. Hugh Blair, whose appointment, as we heard, to the newly founded Chair of Rhetoric and Bell Letter in Edinburgh 250 years ago, provides the occasion for this evening's lecture, has some claim to be regarded as the first of those professors of English from whom the Newbolt Report expected so much. Claims to priority of this kind inevitably get tangled in matters of definition. There are, I'm sorry to tell you, learned persons who would murmur that the first lectures about rhetoric and belle lettres delivered from a professorial chair were actually given over a decade earlier in Glasgow. And Robert Crawford has made the case for the priority of St. Andrews. And there are even those spoil sports who say that the first professor of English literature so designated was actually to be found in London in the 1820s. But obviously it would be ungracious of me as your guest and as a non-Scot 
to elaborate any of those subversive thoughts. And anyway, the pleasing institutional continuity of the Regis Chair here provides a convenient thread for my reflections about the relations between academic and non-academic literary criticism in the decades separating Blair's election from the coalition report. By the time of the latter, there had come into existence a pattern of institutions and activities which bears a recognisable relation to the modern discipline of English studies. There were degrees and departments and chairs and journals all explicitly and exclusively devoted to the subject. Even Cambridge now taught it, with the newly founded English Tripos examined for the first time also in 1921. Of course, much water still had to flow under many bridges and much blood to be spattered on many carpets before we arrive at the current state or states of the discipline. But the main lines of intellectual and cultural as well as institutional continuity from the 1920s onwards are perhaps clear. However, they seem to me much less clear when we try to survey the 160 years that separated Blair's appointment from Newbolt's report. And we risk several kinds of anachronism if we try to construct a single line of academic descent across those intervening decades. Though the occasion for this evening's lecture is a pleasing form of local continuity, the larger story of which it is a part is rather one of disjunction, hiatus, and obscurity. And certainly we shouldn't let the apparent continuity of titles mislead us. Professor did not altogether signify what we understand by the term, and English literature designated forms of writing and types of pedagogy that only partly corresponded to the discipline with which we are familiar today. But alongside and around, and indeed cutting across, any narrative of disciplinary or institutional development, there are, of course, a host of other stories to be told about the changing roles of men of letters, about the practices of reviewing, about the forms of publishing and other features of the wider literary culture. Blair's lectures, after all, were roughly contemporaneous with Johnson's Lives of the Poets, just as the Newbolt Report could be read alongside T.S. Eliot's The Sacred Wood. These contrasting worlds are sometimes figured as the Ivory Tower and Grub Street, but not only are those tropes now hackneyed to the point of unusability, they also risk suggesting two separate and self-contained worlds, rather than the shifting constellation of roles and forms of critical attention that I want to explore this evening. Writers may have various imagined readers in mind when they are writing, phantoms who may well not coincide with the figure whom critics identify as the implied reader of the resulting text, a phantom who, in turn, may not coincide with any of the myriad readers texts actually find for themselves across cultures and even across centuries. I'm going to offer a few brisk generalizations about these questions, focusing particularly on the relation between professors and their publics, but to counter the inevitably rather schematic character of such generalizations, I'm going to intersperse a few detailed vignettes along the way. Perhaps the first thing to emphasize about the public to whom Blair addressed his lectures in the 1760s and 1770s is just how young they were, often not much more than 15 or even less. Some of what the unruly youths who populated his lecture hall had got from him was, to put it in its most provocative form, instruction in how to pass as a member of that anglicized form of polite society that had grown up since the Union. Improbable as it may seem, an implicit premise of his teaching was that the sons of the gentry and professional class, not to mention the much mythologized lad of parts, would have better job prospects if they could learn to write more like Addison. Since English has for so long figured as the antitype to the immediately utilitarian or vocational purposes which universities have always also served, it may be worth emphasizing the largely practical ends to which Blair's teaching was directed. If there's any validity in seeing his lectures as some kind of disciplinary starting point, I'm afraid it would have to be said that from the outset, the heart of an education in English literature has been the acquisition of transferable skills. Much of his time was spent on grammar and composition. Insofar as individual writers were discussed, it was not as examples of what we have come to call imaginative literature, but rather as 
models of good writing. Blair, as I'm sure many of you here will know, was part of that wider development within rhetoric in the 18th century, moving away from the classical exemplars, whose work was political in orientation, focused on persuading listeners to one course of action over another, and towards a modern rhetoric more concerned with forms of politeness and social exchange, a useful adjunct to self-advancement. Although the title page of the first edition of the lectures, published in 1783, describes its author as, in this order, Minister of the High Church and Professor of Rhetoric and Belles Lettres in the University of Edinburgh, it's important to recognise, as Fiona Stafford, among others, has pointed out, that there is very little explicit reference to Scotland or Scottish writing in Blair's text, his enthusiasm for Macpherson's Ossian aside. And that when the lectures were sold in England, they simply acquired, as Stafford puts it, the impersonal authority of the textbook and could be placed on the shelf next to Johnson's dictionary. In fact, Blair's lectures were an early instance of distance learning. Many profited from them who never came near his lecture hall. Before he published them, some students displayed entrepreneurial initiative that I suppose would today be commended and sold copies of their notes. And once published, they enjoyed a far-flung influence especially in the heavily Scottish-influenced colleges of the United States. It's been calculated that in the course of the 19th century, Blair's lectures went through 26 complete and 52 abridged editions. A further reminder, I think, that when thinking of publics, we should not confine ourselves to the immediate and the local. And this brings me to my first illustrative vignette. Thomas Cooper who was born into a very poor primitive Methodist family in the English East Midlands in 1805, worked as a cobbler while reading voraciously. He makes several appearances in Jonathan Rose's The Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. He became both a chartist and a poet, rising early to study before his day's work and then spending his few leisure hours giving addresses to young chartists. His autobiography tells not just of his raw hunger for literature of all sorts, but of his need and desire for sources of critical and intellectual guidance. And it's in this regard that he records, Blair's lectures on rhetoric and belles lettres was another book I analyzed very closely and laboriously, being determined on acquiring a thorough judgment of style and excellence. To that end, he took extensive notes on Blair's text, examined the examples that Blair analyzed, and committed many passages to memory. Blair, of course, may have had principally the needs and social and career aspirations of the sons of the Edinburgh genteel classes of the 1760s and 1770s in mind, but well into the mid-19th century, he could remain an authoritative source for those who often from very different social backgrounds and for very different political purposes were in search of a thorough judgment of style and excellence. By the time Cooper was performing his heroic feats of self-education, institutions had been established in London that came to use the title university, teaching a subject that called itself English literature. True to the spirit of its founders, University College initially emphasized the utility of composition, leading to gainful employment. True to its countervailing inspiration, King's College, by contrast, emphasized a more Coleridgean conception of self-cultivation and an address to higher things. But an element of overlap is suggested by the career of Thomas Dale, who has the distinction of being the first holder both of the Chair of English Language and Literature at University College from 19, 1828 to 1830, and then of the Chair of English Literature and History at King's from 1835 to 40. But in many respects, Dale belonged to the old world rather than what was becoming the new, in that he mainly seems to have taught classes in composition, drawing explicitly on Blair, whereas his successors, most notably F.D. Morris at King's, were importing into their lectures the three elements that came to mark London teaching of this period, Christianity, Englishness, and moral earnestness. Perhaps the pithiest expression of the shift came in Charles Kingsley's lectures at Queen's College, an offshoot of King's that catered for female students, when he declared that the true principles of composition derive from God rather than Hugh Blair. In their early years, the London colleges were small, lacking in prestige, 
and performing some of the functions we would today associate with further education colleges, nudging part-time students towards better career opportunities, where the role of a professor corresponded in some respects to that of a part-time tutor at such colleges. Also, the fortunes of English literature as a course of study soon came to be bound up with what was, if not exactly an invention of the Victorians, then a procedure or institution that acquired unprecedented social significance in the mid-19th century, the competitive examination. The spirit of Northcote Trevelyan was abroad in the land. Even Sandhurst started to have entrance exams. And few decisions stimulated the popularity of the teaching of English as much as the decision in 1854 to make English one of the subjects examined for entry to the administrative service of the East India Company, what became the Indian Civil Service, one of the largest employers of the products of the newly reformed public schools. And with examinations came the great vice of exam culture, cramming. I suppose I do have to explain that that does go with the exam culture. <laughs> And with cramming came primers of facts about literature, or in more intellectually respectable terms, literary history. And this should remind us that the fate of English as a subject in schools, no less than universities, was intimately bound up with, if in inverse relation to, the fate of classics. In the mid-Victorian years in particular, a central educational question was whether the teaching of texts in the vernacular could ever match the supposed rigor and intellectual training provided by what had been the culturally ven venerated education of a gentleman for many, many years. As this suggests, matters of status and pure snobbery were involved, but English had even larger social forces on its side. Nothing promoted the study of English literature more effectively than increasing recognition of the fact that the expanding school population could not be expected to devote its energies principally to composing Latin epigrams. As one advocate of the New Studies put it in 1867, we do not desire to supersede Greek and Latin, but while we recognize their merits, we denounce their monopoly. Although English may have recommended itself on grounds of accessibility and even usefulness, it seemed to its critics, lamentably, to fail to match the classics in terms of rigor. In the phrase that one of its opponents, the historian E.A. Freeman, made famous later in the century, the new subject amounted to little more than mere chatter about Shelley. <laughs> However, even as the first teachers were giving their ethically uplifting addresses in Gower Street and the Strand, a new intellectual force was abroad that, promoted, that, that promised to meet this requirement, while at the same time it helped to drive out what remained of rhetoric, at least in England. It came, like so many of the intellectual currents that moulded scholarship and intellectual life in the 19th century, from Germany. In the late 18th century, philology in English still meant the general study of classical literature, or even just scholarship tout court. But under the influence of the researches of Schlegel, Grimm, Bopp, and others, a new form of inquiry came in the form of study of the history and evolution of language in a way that would open the door to understanding the cultural evolution of mankind as a whole. And this ambitious new science became a fashionable, in fact, somewhat insurgent approach in Britain from the 1830s and 1840s. And in the records of the appointments to the London chairs and the in-house debates about what to teach, we can see traces of the struggle as the older approaches, both the more utilitarian and the more aesthetic, tried to repel and then finally to absorb the challenge of this new science. I suppose it's difficult now to imagine and recover the grand hopes that were invested in philology, an enterprise which, as I say, promised to provide the key to human history rather than simply describing the taxonomy of linguistic forms. In addition, its revelation of the importance of the Teutonic roots of modern English could be used to stoke up a variety of political and patriotic enthusiasms, which once again challenge any tidy notions about the publics reached by such arcane studies. And this brings me to my second vignette. When Henry Rogers, a Congregationalist minister, was appointed to the Chair of English Literature at UCL in 1836. 
he became the third holder of the chair in eight years. Perhaps staff recension wasn't their forte. And Rogers initially proposed to continue the practical emphasis on composition. But the College Senate were aware of wider scholarly currents. And so when accepting the post, Rogers had, with disarming ingenuousness, acceded to their wishes and, as the record says, promised to apply himself to Anglo-Saxon. And apply himself, he duly did, becoming something of an evangelist for the subject. So much so, indeed, that in 1839, he published a long review essay in the Edinburgh Review on Bosworth's Dictionary of the Anglo-Saxon Language with a preface on the origins and connection of the Germanic tongues, a map of languages, and the essentials of Anglo-Saxon grammar. And Rogers welcomed this formidable-sounding work as being not simply of interest to scholars. There are, he wrote, or at any event soon will be, many, by no means ambitious of achieving the fame of profound Anglo-Saxon scholarship, to whose library a Saxon and English lexicon of moderate size and reasonable price will be a welcome addition. He acknowledged that profound knowledge of such a subject would always be a rarity, and he went on, still, if we mistake not, the day is not far distant when it will be considered disgraceful to a well-bred Englishman to be ignorant, as multitudes otherwise well-informed now are, of the history and structure of the English tongue. Now, he may have been, as I say, displaying the zeal of the convert here, but it's striking that he felt able to inform the readers of the Edinburgh Review, a particular public, which after all contained no small proportion of well-bred Englishmen, that it would soon be considered disgraceful to members of that class not to possess a knowledge of the history and structure of the English tongue, and more particularly, as he said, of the precise relations of Anglo-Saxon to modern English. However, the very quality that gave philology its patina of scientific legitimacy also constituted its fundamental defect as far as school and undergraduate education was concerned, namely that it was in the end too specialised to serve as a vehicle for more general cultivation. As John Churton Collins was able to argue with some cogency later in the century, in its highest departments, philology is a branch of learning of immense interest and value, and it is justly entitled to its place in the front rank of science. But it must not be confounded with literature. Up to the present time, it has, in consequence of that confusion, been allowed to fill a place in education altogether disproportionate to its insignificance as an instrument of culture. In other words, its educational value did not match its scholarly importance. But in less obvious ways, philology did play a part in legitimating the study of English, precisely because at a crucial period in the debates about the educational position of classics, it was the one form of study that could plausibly claim comparable rigor and exactness. Philology, we may say, was the pilot essential for navigating English studies through the shallows of the debate about education in the ancient versus education in the vernacular languages, but dropped once the high seas of literature were in sight. And its chief legacy, apart from the presence of English language and literature in the titles of chairs and departments, was the continuing requirement in many places, and some well into the middle of the 20th century, that the study of English literature had to begin with the study of Anglo-Saxon. One way to characterise the energies that increasingly powered the expansion of the subject in the mid-Victorian period might be to say that more attention was coming to be paid to what counted as genuinely English than what counted as literature. The older, inclusive sense of the latter term was still employed. Our greatest authors were the object of study, and they included numerous historians, orators, philosophers, and so on. What was required, as the committee that established that examination for the entry into the East India Company, as they put it, was knowledge of our poets, wits, and philosophers. And the fact that they were ours became increasingly important. So this represented a more historicized as well as a more culturally specific conception than that underpinning the older rhetorical tradition, still then powerful in Scotland, where the best classical and modern authors alike tended to be exploited in instrumental, not nationalist terms. 
In the 1870s and 1880s, the alliance of literature, history, and a racialized form of national identity increasingly displaced philology as the dominant form of the study of English language and literature. We get a glimpse of the, I think, surprising excitement which could be attached to ostensibly recondite inquiries in this vein by jumping forward to a remark by Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch at the time of the First World War. Quiller Cooch was to go on to be a member of that Newbolt committee I quoted earlier, though he only attended one of its meetings, having discovered, as its historian dryly remarks, that in the education department's offices, only soft drinks were to be procured. <laughs> I think it's possibly for this reason that his Cambridge students referred to him as Professor Swiller Hooch. <laughs> in any event, consider the following passage from a 1916 lecture. Few in this room are old enough to remember the shock of awed surprise which fell upon young minds presented in the late 70s and early 80s of the last century with Freeman's Norman Conquest or Green's short history of the English people in which, as through parting clouds of darkness, we beheld our ancestry, literary as well as political, radiantly legitimised. Any of you who've read the late John Burroughs' wonderful book, A Liberal Descent, will immediately recognise this strain of Victorian historical enthusiasm. But it's worth pausing, I think, for a moment to reflect on what might be involved in having one's literary ancestry radiantly legitimised, and especially on how that task could be affected by rather dry accounts of early medieval English history. Ideas of what counted as authentically English were in play here, with more than a hint of Norman yoke theory behind them. But perhaps there is less need to dwell on the cultural purposes served by the identification of literary traditions that arguably predate some form of alien annexation in Scotland than there is in England. As we know from the work of George Davy, Robert Anderson and others, for the first two thirds of the 19th century, the Scottish professors of the subject still tended to cultivate rhetoric as part of the broad curriculum in logic more a training in how to think and write clearly than in the aesthetic appreciation of literature. Alexander Bain, Professor of Logic and English Literature at Aberdeen from 1860 to 1880, was an influential late representative of this tradition. Writing in the Fortnightly Review in 1869, he opined that acquiring a taste for literature was something students could be left to do in their leisure hours. And sounding Uncannily like an anticipation of the modern spokesman for the Department of Business, he declared, the youthful pupil's forenoon hours are too precious for this kind of work. I could not vote to tax the nation for coaching in Hamlet and Macbeth. But the newer intellectual fashions were starting to leave their mark in Scotland too. And as Nigel Leese has observed of John Nicholl, the first of his predecessors in the Regis Chair of English Language and Literature at Glasgow, founded in 1862, it proved possible still to uphold the generalist aspirations of the traditional Scottish curriculum while bringing more historical and indeed critical perspectives to bear on the study of English literature. By this point, chairs and degrees in Inglit were starting to be common, become common in the recently established civic universities in England. So here we must be careful not to let anachronistic ideas about professional specialisation mislead us. When in 1851 A.J. Scott was appointed as the newly founded Owens College in Manchester, uh, the colonel of what became Manchester University, his full title was Professor of Comparative Grammar of English Language and Literature, of Logic and of Mental and Moral Philosophy. And in order that time should not sit heavily on his hands, he was also the college principal. <laughs> but nor should we assume a simple story of progress and increasing demand. The tiny University of Durham, founded in 18, uh, 1832, initially made no provision for the teaching of English. A proposal was made in 1846 to create, fashionably, if a little obscurely, a readership of Anglo-Saxon and Old English literature. But nothing seems to have come of it. And then, as the subject's historian, D.J. Palmer, coolly reports, in 1882, the Reverend H.J. Marston was made a reader in English literature, 
His duties were to give two public lectures in each of the two winter terms. But interest flagged and the readership was discontinued in 1889. And in general, the teaching of English in both uh, England and Scotland in the universities in the 19th century seems to have been rather low in intellectual level and broadly utilitarian in its aim. As we know, examination questions throw a particularly pitiless light on educational activity of all kinds. But a few examples may prevent us from taking a too elevated view of the educational experience involved. So from Edinburgh in 1860. Enumerate the leading English poets in chronological order. <laughs> or from Aberdeen in 1906. List the countries that are made the subject of description in the first and second cantos of Child Harold's Pilgrimage. <laughs> or finally, this from Trinity College Dublin in 1852. Who is our oldest prose author? I assume they meant earliest, but you never know. <laughs> As always, we know rather little about who the students were and what they took away from these courses. But in thinking of the relevant publics, we should remember the clinching argument put forward by one proponent of establishing a final honours school in English at Oxford in the 1880s. He said, the women should be considered, and the second and third rate men who are to become schoolmasters. <laughs> But well, of course, women soon became nationally the majority of students of English, and school teaching remained one of the most common career destinations well into the second half of the 20th century. And this brings me to my third vignette. In 1885, after considerable debate, Oxford established a new chair in English language and literature. As Freeman, again, crustily confided to one correspondent, all the world is standing. Every chatterer in every newspaper thinks he is good enough for English language and literature. Or as Palmer, in soberer language, put it later, the chair attracted a wide field of candidates, including some of the most brilliant men of letters of the day. And this brilliance is normally contrasted with the narrow range and obscure reputation of the successful candidate. Since Oxford, with what its critics might regard as characteristic obstructiveness, managed to frustrate the hopes invested in the new chair by appointing a philologist who specialised in Old Icelandic. <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass either you or the shade of his memory by asking for a show of hands by those who have heard of, let alone read anything by, the successful candidate, A.S. Napier. Of course, this account can be made to seem a familiar piece of demonology, frequently repeated by university-bashing media in our own day. The intellectually hidebound and self-protective university cannot cope with the threat from the unorthodox brilliance of the representatives of lay culture. However, although this version of the episode has frequently been repeated, I have to say that the issue looks much less clear-cut on closer inspection. A detailed examination of the achievements up to that point of all the candidates for that post prompts in me two thoughts. First, it seems very unclear from these examples that there was any agreed expectation about what might count as relevant qualification. So heterogeneous, and in truth so limited, were those achievements. And second, by modern standards, none of the candidates, with the partial exception of Edward Dowden, professor at Trinity College Dublin, had demonstrated an indisputable capacity to teach and contribute to scholarship in the field designated by the chair. Once Napier's appointment had been announced, the electors were, Freeman reported again to his correspondent, being roundly abused for their choice, and he moved into justificatory mode. The main point, of course, he wrote, was to choose a scholar and not a chatterer. Now, the chatterers have command of the newspapers, and the scholars have not. That's what the fuss is about. I have no doubt that to any maker of paragraphs, Matthew Elderman of Babblers seems a greater man than William of Chester. Well, let me decode for you. Matthew here is, of course, Matthew Arnold, acknowledged by this date as the leading man of letters of his day. And William is Freeman's colleague and friend, William Stubbs, who had recently moved from the Regis Chair of Modern History at Oxford 
to the bishopric of Chester, William of Chester, a move which should in itself make us cautious about importing later assumptions about career patterns into a period still shaped by older cultural ideals. Several of the early teachers of English gave up their chairs when they had the opportunity to move to a cathedral deanship or other high office in the church. Now Freeman's rather oblique mention of Arnold calls up the one name you might expect to figure in my story. If I don't discuss him in any detail, it is in part because his place in the actual history of the university teaching of English, as opposed to the cultural ideals later invoked to justify that study, was very limited. His relation to the developments I've been briefly describing is well caught by the fact that when in 1886, towards the end of his life, he was asked his view about the desirability of teaching English literature, he replied that such materials should only be taught in conjunction with Greek and Latin literature. And Arnold's own reviewing of primers produced for the new subject, such as Stopford Brooks' best-selling English literature in 1876, indicated, I think, where the balance of critical power actually lay. The general periodicals still provided more obvious homes for high-quality literary criticism than did the pinched pedagogy of the early professors, even though Churton Collins tirelessly propagandised for the opposite view, namely that one reason why the subject had to be established in universities was to raise the level of literary scholarship in the reviews. I think this episode might also remind us that while a reputation as a periodical essayist and reviewer was often seen, certainly into the early 20th century, as a qualification to become a professor, the reverse was much less true. When in 1852 David Masson had been appointed to the UCL chair at the age of 30, his qualifications consisted chiefly of a couple of popular history guides and a number of articles in the early Victorian general periodicals. And it was obviously not thought incompatible with his post for him to serve the rising publishing firm of Macmillan's in a variety of roles, acting as editor of their new monthly journal from 1859 to 1868, three years after he moved to the Regis chair here in Edinburgh. He was succeeded at University College by Henry Morley, who had up till that point chiefly been employed on Dickens' Middlebrow Journal all the year round. That was his qualification. Masson held the Edinburgh chair, as some of you know, for 30 years. And when he retired from it in 1895, there was once again a heterogeneous throng of aspirant professors, teeming perhaps to get inside the walls, including W.E. Henley, art critic, minor poet, editor of the National Observer, and patron of a group of younger writers known as the Henley Regatta, Walter Raleigh, who had a few years earlier been appointed Professor of English at Liverpool at the age of 28, when, as his biographer records, his only publication of note was a paper on Browning that he had read to the Browning Society while he was still at Cambridge. I wonder what the publications not of note were like. <laughs> and, of course, the ever-persistent Churton Collins, champion of the standards of an academic discipline which had so far refused to admit him, and finally, the successful candidate, George Saintsbury, the most prolific bookman and reviewer of his day, whose chief methodological principle, it was said, was read everything. But it's interesting as well, though, isn't it, that these early literature chairs were sought after, even by relatively successful men of letters, in part, of course, for the security of income, but increasingly, perhaps, because they conferred a certain prestige or authority on their holders. Stephen Potter, writing in the 1930s in The Muse in Chains, still spoke for this world when he referred to Saintsbury succeeding Masson in, as he said, what was still far the most important and influential of the literature chairs. Oxford finally decided to establish a chair indisputably in English literature in 1904 to which Raleigh was appointed, and then, belatedly, Cambridge accepted a donation from the newspaper magnate Lord Harmsworth in 1911 to establish a chair in memory of the recently deceased Edward VII. In an attempt to escape the increasingly dead hand of philology, the statutes for the new chair explicitly commanded, as I discover they still do, that 
the professor shall treat this subject on literary and critical rather than on philological and linguistic lines. But of course, the old academic Adam is not so easily kept down, and the first holder of the chair turned out to be the classical scholar A.W. Verrill, an authority on Aeschylus and Euripides. But when, perhaps considerately, he died not long after taking up the post, the Liberal government turned to one of the pillars of the Liberal Party in Cornwall, Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch, novelist, man of letters, future absentee member of the Newbolt Committee, and Commodore of the FOE Yacht Squadron. That process that we call in retrospect professionalisation was in practice patchy, contradictory and incomplete. To bring matters full circle, my final vignette comes once again from 1921, the year of the Newbolt Report, and appropriately enough, it involves a scholarly work by one of Blair's successors in the Regis Chair, being reviewed by an archetypal representative of lay literary culture, an up-and-coming young freelance critic and poet. But even here, what we find is not in any simple sense a clash of opposed worlds, not least because this relatively slight review essay went on to become one of the pieces of literary criticism that was most widely cited in the teaching and study of English literature over the succeeding half century. The professor in question was H.J.C. Grierson, eventually to be Sir Herbert Grierson, a product of the final days of the traditional Scottish general curriculum at Aberdeen and then of Greats at Oxford, who by this point was becoming the doyen of a new breed of scholarly textual editors. In 1893, the professorship that Bain and Minto had held at Aberdeen was subdivided into the chair of logic and a new chair of English language and literature. However, when appointed to this latter chair straight from Oxford, Grierson had still been required to prepare a course of lectures on composition and style. Though we can discern, I think, something of a culture clash between fashionable Oxford aestheticism and the mores of the Granite City, in Palmer's dry report that the young Grierson's enthusiasm for Pater was not wholly shared by that doer and conservative community. Grierson's great edition of Dunn in 1912 helped fuel a broader revival of interest in the poetry of the first half of the 17th century. But indirectly, he owes his most lasting place in the history of criticism to one particular review of his anthology, Metaphysical Lyrics and Poems of the 17th Century, published by Oxford University Press in the autumn of 1921. There were by this date several other professors of English to whom it could have been sent for review. But Bruce Richmond, the founding editor of the Times Literary Supplement, liked to solicit a Catholic range of contributors from various corners of the literary world. And so he chose to send it to a 33-year-old American former graduate student in philosophy who was now working in a bank and who in the previous three or four years had been turning himself into one of the hottest properties in literary London with his startling poems and provocative critical essays. T.S. Eliot, for those of you who hadn't guessed, the reviewer in question, described Grierson's anthology as, in itself, a piece of criticism and a provocation of criticism. And the criticism it provoked in this short review essay included Eliot's characteristically offhand but hugely influential speculation about that dissociation of sensibility that allegedly affected the mind of England between the time of Dunn and Lord Har Herbert of Jarbury and the time of Tennyson and Browning. And yet again here, it's the interrelation of the academic and non-academic, indeed the cancelling of the force of the conventional distinction that is in play. As that most scholarly of genres, the annotated edition, provided the peg for a meta-historical speculation in a weekly paper that played a notable part in the decades from the 1920s to the 1950s in radiantly legitimizing a literary inheritance, to borrow Quillacucci's phrase, both for modernist poets and for embattled critics, a part comparable perhaps to that played for an earlier generation by the antiquarian enthusiasms of Victorian Teutonizing historians. Not, interestingly, that either its author or its first readers seem to have had any inkling of the extraordinary career that would be enjoyed by what began simply as the lead review for the week of the 20th of October 1921. I have just finished an article, 
unsatisfactory to myself, Eliot reported to his friend Richard Aldington, and it's interesting to see that in his own brief summary of that article, he made no mention of the idea of the dissociation of sensibility. And in fact, the only response the piece provoked in the correspondence columns of the TLS for the rest of that year came, conveniently enough for my purpose, from Grierson's predecessor in the Regis chair, George Saintsbury. But Saintsbury too did not appear to register any of what later generations of readers took to be so revolutionary in Eliot's interpretation of poetic history. And in a curiously inconsequential exchange, though perhaps current readers of the TLS wouldn't find that curious, Saintsbury emphasized that the capacity to go beyond first thoughts was indeed a particularly marked feature of the so-called metaphysicals. Eliot, in response, suggested that it was not confined to that generation, but was to be found in Dante, Shakespeare, and others, and so on. But the retired professor and the anonymous reviewer wrote as though they shared in the learned literary culture of the day without any suggestion of turf wars between academics and man of letters. According to one of the most authoritative of recent histories of literary criticism, Eliot stands historically between 20th century academic criticism with its tendency towards specialization and theory and 19th century journalistic and generalist criticism. He is, to put it another way, the first non-academic critic who sounds like an academic critic. Well, I think that last phrase is quite a nice one, and it captures something distinctive about the tone of many of Eliot's early critical performances, with their deployment of grave, oblique learning in the service of a subversive poetic. But the neatness of the contrast between the two centuries is surely exaggerated. Writing about English literature had long been, and was to continue to be, both specialised and generalist. Moreover, despite going on to become perhaps the single greatest influence on the academic literary criticism of the next couple of generations, Eliot himself remained characteristically sceptical about the whole enterprise. He and Virginia Woolf had a wary, prickly relationship, but there were several things they agreed about, the most relevant of which is recorded in her diary for 1933. And we agreed about the infamy of teaching English, the idiocy of lectures, the whole hierarchy of professor system, and so on. At any rate, I got him to go some way with me in denouncing Oxford and Cambridge. Well, that last is, of course, always good sport, uh, especially for a woman famously conscious of her exclusion. And the infamy of teaching English has been denounced for as long as English has been taught. So it strikes me you may think it imprudent of me to quote such a formidable duo on the idiocy of lectures just at this moment. In thinking of the publics re reached by different forms of criticism, we may say that in the first instance, the readership for Eliot's review essay comprised the 30,000 or so subscribers to the Times Literary Supplement in the early 1920s. But as with Blair's lectures over a century earlier, that would be an unimaginative and overly mechanical way to envisage the publics eventually reached by this casually provocative piece. The essay went on to find a far larger public through its inclusion in Eliot's Selected Essays, first published in 1932, a work which has been described as possibly the most widely read critical book in the middle of the 20th century in English. And it would be difficult to say whether the bulk of those readers should be described as academic or not, and perhaps the example should make us cautious about retrojecting that binary distinction. Cultural change has a habit of reclassifying reading matter in ways that neither its authors nor its originally intended readers can altogether predict. The Newbolt report, as you heard, fell back on a conventional metaphor to distinguish the spheres of the professors from that of the teeming multitudes outside the walls. But in practice, writing about literature has never respected that imaginary boundary. Metaphors of inside and outside are, in any case, treacherous instruments when it comes to thinking about the ways in which the activities of universities and their host societies are related, where the walls have an uncanny tendency to reveal themselves to be a Merbius strip, and never more so, we may say, than when 44% of the age cohort attend such institutions. The activities of those who are, in one way or another, connected with universities have bulked much larger in the literary and intellectual history of the 20th century than they did of the 19th, let alone the 18th, and there seems every reason to expect that pattern to continue in the 21st century. 
But as I hope some of my examples have suggested in their informal way, it's usually a mistake to allow the familiar labels to mislead us into thinking of two hermetically sealed worlds, thought of as inside and outside, academia and the wider culture, the ivory tower and Grub Street. The academic study of Eng Lit has become vastly more professionalised, more bureaucratised even, than the generation of Saintsbury and Grierson could ever have imagined. But it has not, even now, severed all communication with that teeming population outside the walls, and nor could it or should it do so. Recognition of the fact that the public's actually reached by critics, as by other writers, have usually been plural, should also make us sceptical of all declinist laments about the disappearance of the reading public, always figured in the singular. Similarly, some acquaintance with the varied and episodic history of English as a subject for academic study should lead us to doubt the recurrent allegation that it is the most recent incarnation of disciplinary professionalism that has finally severed all links between general readers of literature and professional students of Englit. Self-appointed spokespersons for the lay reader have always lamented that the golden age of reading is over, and they have long complained that it is the narrowness and aridity of the academic discipline of Englit that are threatening to kill the love of literature. Such complaints, I think, have to be seen as part of that necessary dialectic whereby each generation simultaneously demands that matters of cultural importance be made the object of systematic study, while worrying that the effect of such study is to lose sight of what was important in the first place. Composition may not be the only subject where self-styled iconoclasts have repeatedly felt the need to proclaim that the true principles derive from God rather than from Hugh Blair. Well, the future is, as historians like to say, not my period. We're all aware that the processes which we, for now, still call publishing are changing fundamentally and dramatically. And we're no less aware that universities themselves and their relations with their various publics are being changed in ways that may turn out to be equally fundamental. Though I'm delighted to be able to say, recalling the title of this lecture series, that a more enlightened view of universities as a public good seems to prevail in Scotland than south of the border. What all this may mean for criticism and its publics, we simply cannot know. But I like to think that somewhere in the world, there will still be the modern day version of our chartist cobbler, who driven by an intellectual and literary appetite and being now as then, determined on acquiring a thorough judgment of style and excellence, may come across a work initially addressed to a quite other public, a work that may or may not call itself literary criticism and that may or may not be written by someone whom others call professor, and that that work may go some way towards satisfying that appetite. And all the while, something of this sort continues to happen I see no reason for enveloping cultural pessimism, still less for despair. And it's in that spirit that I salute the first quarter millennium of Edinburgh's Regis Chair of English and Rhetoric and English Literature. Thank you very much. Down, I'll no, I'll up here. <laughs> Professor Collini has very uh, graciously and actually very willingly uh, wanted to uh, open up for a question and answer session. So we have two roving microphones. If you could wait until the uh, microphone reaches you, if you want to ask a question, then ask your question, please. So questions, one in the middle here. Um, what effect do you think the internet and the democratisation of opinion will have on the future? Sorry, Mr. Ford, what effect? Um, what effect do you think the internet and the democratisation of opinion will have on the future of English literature? <laughs> well, uh, yes. Um, how many hours have we got? <laughs> um, 
the first thing I would say about this is, uh, since, as you see tonight, what I'm trying to do is give really rather a long historical perspective to some changes and anxieties which take, I think, a particular form in each generation, is to say that um, this would not be the first time that people have been anxious that some technological change or some change in form of distribution and so on of writing is going to have some uh, dramatic and maybe fatal effect. Um, the second thing I would say is I don't think we know enough about this yet. Um, but one of the things that many people have observed, I, this is not a, a distinctive view of my own, I'm merely repeating what people who write about this say, is that although at first sight what happens is a kind of immense proliferation of opinion and a situation in which it may be thought then that all opinion is equally authoritative or not, that the, as it were, the implied authority of the critic figure is dissolved in this larger democracy of voices, although that may seem to be the effect of the uh, greater accessibility of um, electronic forms of communication and the internet and so on, what they detect as happening is that precisely because of the volume, there then comes to be something of a premium for a certain kind of considered or vindicated, legitimated, authoritative comment. That is to say, the whole process within the electronic world replicates something of what social and cultural processes have done over the centuries to try to identify places where you might find more considered perhaps better informed opinion than you might in just any message, comment stream, blog, or whatever. Now, I don't know whether that will continue to be the case, uh, because obviously one way you might read that is there's a kind of carryover of cultural attitudes from the sort of time that I ended with here, where certain authoritative figures are listened to, mainly in uh, the main reviewing outlets and cultural periodicals and so on, and later perhaps the radio, that those attitudes have carried over and when they are fully dissolved by the sort of changes you point towards, then in fact that desire or even that assumption that there could be a certain more considered or authoritative opinion will itself be dissolved uh, and then we'll have something else altogether. Uh, that's even further in the future and even less my period, but that's as far as I can get with it from here. Another question, one at the back. I can have a show of hands, we can get some microphones out. And, uh, any more questions? And that one's going across. I was intrigued by your um, act of translation at the beginning of trying to find equivalents in managerial speak for some of the terms that you were using elsewhere. And I wondered whether one of the ways of thinking about the invocation of the future that you began with would be the um, managerial term going forward. <laughs> and that therefore one of the things we've noticed about the coalition policy now is that we've replaced notions of a future with the notion of something predictable on a short-term profit basis. And that therefore one of the problems for literary criticism and the arts more generally as in terms of their disciplinary status, is that because literature is itself such an unstable mm. object, assuming we can call it an object at all, literary criticism similarly has to be rather unpredictable. And that this doesn't really fit with the managerial notion of going forward rather than a more poetic invocation mm. of the future. Mm. I'm tempted to begin by saying, don't start me. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I agree entirely with what you say. Um, I think it's a very good observation. Um, and certainly, as you could see from that opening quotation from the Newbolt report, um, there it rests on um, a very traditional notion of bringing culture to the, as it were, dark places that do not have it. Uh, there is no anxiety in the language of that report, even in the quotation I gave you. There is no anxiety of any relativizing kind that there may be other sources of light. Maybe the heathen have their own sources of light and don't need the missionary to come uh, bearing copies of uh, Pope and Addison and so on. Um, I think that, that has gone, f well, whether for good it has gone anyway. And I think actually for the better myself, that, that uh, unquestioned confidence. Uh, too often was the support of various kinds of snobbery uh, and exclusion that we don't, I think, need. The 
point that you ended with, though, is, is, is much more uh, is intriguing and is much more difficult, I think, to get a hold on, which is that some languages of measurable and predictable processes better fit certain kinds of intellectual inquiry than others. Uh, I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm not the first person to say this, uh, but it is, a, it is the case, and it is something that we see happening, I think, now in the forms of assessment and so on applied to universities and in universities' own internal forms quite often of management. And I would simply say about that, because everyone here has their own experience of that, I'm sure, but I would simply say that I do think that those of us who work in English departments have to try to work into the language which we use for various public and justificatory and descriptive purposes as much of the insistence on that unpredictable open-endedness as we possibly can. The whole language of delivery always implies that you have a thing over here and you deliver it over there. Education is more or less like a pizza. Um, and the ways in which the uh, encounter between a reader and a text, an encounter in particular perhaps between a student and some new element of their course, will spark and fire in directions which the teacher did not design and may even not be aware have happened when the course ends and they write their dreary report on it. Nonetheless, may be the most valuable thing that happened in that course. And I do think that we have to just do our best, I have no magic wand to wave here, but to do our best in our own descriptions of these things to try to capture that at least and keep uh, a space for that to happen, uh, even as you rightly say, when so many forces are driving it the other way. I was just curious, as uh, the world increasingly speaks English and is now adopting uh, ways of writing English, which even rivals uh, the original creators of the language, um, whether or not uh, feeling that it was uh, difficult to push English literature upon former colonies in addition to uh, third world and, as we call it now, developing uh, countries is actually a mistake uh, according to most contemporary academics. As someone who comes from those areas, I think it might be uh, a rather good uh, policy for uh, academia in this country to, may think, uh, to possibly think that they could have it alongside um, the English writers of that, those areas. And rather than say uh, it should be hermetically sealed off, mm -hmm. we should keep it within ourselves. Indeed, begin pushing it again. Maybe it's a good time to begin doing that. That's, thank you, that's a very nice thought, yes. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, in um, promoting the subject in the 19th century, uh, a very important element that gave it some purchase uh, clearly were forms of nationalist and indeed patriotic identification. The Englishness of the English literature mattered very much uh, at that point. Um, among the things that we have seen um, in the last few decades has been this enormous expansion of what sometimes has been called literature in English, and then quite often world literature um, and the relations between different literary traditions, some of which are in forms of English not traditionally written in England or, or in Britain. Um, that all seems to me, I have to say, uh, an extremely welcome development and throws, up, throws light on some of the uh, more restrictive assumptions that some of the kinds of people I've mentioned here um, for understandable reasons, I think, in their history, never had to question, uh, and that we certainly um, should question. Uh, whether, whether teaching, whether in, in such settings, teaching, as it were, a separate course in English literature alongside material written maybe in some other local vernaculars, maybe taken from elsewhere in the world, is the best way to try to, um, as it were, encourage the reflection and cross-fertilization that I, we might ideally aim at, or whether, in fact, to dissolve that notion of there being something you might separate out as English literature, I think is very tricky. Um, the <coughs> danger with the dissolving, I think, in practice, just to turn to very practical pedagogy, is that it tends to drive out of the curriculum more or less everything before about 1950. 
Um, and so, in some ways, the, the um, claims of some version of English literature in those settings is, as it were, as a vehicle for the history and tradition to be made available and transmitted. Often, the, tran the traditions which writers in those new vernaculars have themselves drawn on, um, famously, you know, Walcott and Homer and you know, all those kinds of examples. Um, so, uh, personally, I think there is still something to be gained uh, from trying to keep that connection with that long history alive without thinking that it monopolises what we would now call literature written in some form of English. Make this the last question, if we may. Um, I was quite interested by what you're talking about with classics and saying that um, there's always been a time when we've put that aside um, as a discipline and we're sort of going forward with English literature. And, going, going forward? <laughs> well, you know, almost in that sense. But um, in terms of what one of the people in the audience said about the sort of the way English is an unstable discipline, would you view the classics as a more sort of stable set of sort of vigorous rules for educating people? Um, and all, I mean, obviously it's quite a vague question, but also I see... Uh, classics is now becoming much more popular and do you see some sort of trend with classics coming back as this new sort of stable discipline which proves to people in the future that you have these sort of traits in academia? Yeah. That <laughs> no, it, it, it makes sense. It of course sets me up as the all-purpose expert on everything under the sun <laughs> to answer this. Um, I think, the, again, where I would begin, you, probably, you, might, you might guess this from the way I approach the subject in the lecture, again, the way I would begin is, of course, classics has not been a single or stable entity. Uh, what, when the Victorians, mid-Victorians, were having the debates that I referred to, um, many of the contributors to those debates still took for granted that um, a, a leisure time reading in Latin literature, at the very least, maybe Greek as well, was the possession of every properly educated gentleman and so on. Um, very often, the classics that were studied in um, public school and at university level in uh, the mid-19th century paid practically no attention to what we might call the, the otherness of these remote, small, agricultural states and societies from which this literature came. The, the, the amount of... Um, historical or sociological perspective on where these classic works came from uh, was often rather lacking. So one of the things you might say that has happened as classics as an academic subject has necessarily uh, become a very minority activity, it was just not the teaching of these subjects in the schools for it to draw upon to, be, to keep its numbers at the major level they were in the 19th century. One of the things that has happened surely is that the, the teaching classics has become a way to engage with um, a whole series of reflections about, I mean, well, often under the heading the classical tradition, but about where certain kinds of ideas in the West came from, with uh, questions about how some of the most enlightened ideas of democracy could even coexist with total acceptance of slavery, and uh, uh, that sense of a very distant, uh, different, but maybe for that very reason valuable to us, set of things to study, that's become much more central, I think, to the teaching of classics everywhere now. And the element of that teaching which the Victorian defenders so insisted on, the, the um, verbal gymnastics of going through all the training in grammar and parsing and then in translation and so on, of course any competent classicist has to master language now, but it's very striking that that is not, uh, as it were, made a selling point of classics as an educational um, activity now uh, and in that sense surely what happens in all these disciplines is that they absorb the concerns and the, and the, and the values of the wider culture um, and adapt them to a particular small body of inherited material and you're as likely to find people thinking about uh, as it were the, the whole question of um, barbarian and others or whole question particularly the whole question of course of um, 
the relation of writing about love and uh, hardly any of it being by women. And questions of that sociological and historicizing kind, you're much more likely to find those now in classics than perhaps often in some modern language uh, subjects. So I think the subject is going to uh, continue for sure, it's going to be very small for sure, but it's going to keep changing for sure in the way I would say all these disciplines are in fact changing. Okay, with that I'd like to uh, uh, begin to thank Professor Collini. As a, as a geneticist who has an interest in genetic modification, I thought I was one of the evangelists and missionaries of the age. I hadn't really thought of my colleagues in English literature as, uh, as, as being missionaries. But I think what we've seen here is uh, 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 two very good things. The first is to congratulate the audience. It's the first public lecture I've been to in many uh, a month. Uh, where the question of independence or further devolution hasn't cropped up. Um, the, 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 the second is, is to thank Professor Collini for showing, I think, missionary zeal uh, about your, your discipline, the history of that discipline, its relevance to um, uh, today, and certainly the teeming horde that has entered the uh, at George Square Lecture Theatre certainly has thoroughly enjoyed uh, what has been an excellent intellectual and stimulating presentation. So will you join me in thanking uh, Professor Collini as the Enlightenment speaker. Thank you very much. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.